Hey, I'm excited. Stacy did an awesome job preaching last Sunday, didn't he? Man, so good. So good. <laughs> I, I I asked him, I said, which which sign do you want to talk about? And he's like, I want I want Lazarus because I want to talk about death. Have at it, man. Have at it. And uh, I thought he did a great job and handled that message so, so well. I've been chewing on it uh, since last Sunday in preparation for this one. And one of, the way we're going to start this, we're going to be in John chapter 4. There's no message notes. And so if you need to follow along on your smartphone or things like that, or your dumb device, uh, whatever that looks like for you, um, to be able to follow along. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 4, verses 43 and 50 to 54. And I tried to stay in that text as much as possible so that we don't jump around and 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 uh, get confused since we don't have you know words and things like that for you to follow along with. But here's the message, plain and simple. We're talking about faith in Jesus today. Is that all right? We're going to talk about Jesus, and we're going to talk about and we're going to talk about having faith in Him even, even when things don't necessarily go our way. Right? How many of you know that's, that's some of the hardest times when it is to have faith? When we look at God and say, God, I've got this figured out. Here's what needs to happen. This person needs to do this. This person needs to do this. This person just needs to go away because I'm not sure why they were created anyway. Um, you know, and, and I'm just kidding. I'm pointing over at Matt, but that's not intentional whatsoever okay um but 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 you know and and we've got it all figured out and then god does something completely different and puts you know you and that person that you said god why did you create them anyway right in a room together on a mission trip together and you all of a sudden are rooming together and you've got to figure things out not that i know that by personal experience but we're going to talk about jesus we're going to talk about having faith even when things don't go away john calvin maybe you've heard of him Uh, John Calvin once said that the heart of man is an idol factory. How many of you would agree with that? Somebody raise your hand in the house. The the heart of man is an idol factory. We've got some idols, don't we? Uh, We've got some things that we play. Idol is defined as anything that's placed between us and God. Right? So that could be money. Um, That could be uh, some of you have walked up this morning and asked about the boat back here. Um, Check your heart. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Ian wants to give that away as a door prize for being here today. But don't get too excited because it's not our boat. Um, But but, but idols come in all different shapes and sizes and forms, don't they? Anything Anything that takes our heart away from God's heart. Undeniably, we have the the tendency to make God in our own image. We have the tendency to make God in our own image. Just think of the many false images of Jesus that have been crafted in our day. I want to think about a couple of those. Jesus, the CEO. Jesus, the the Buddhist. Jesus, the feminist. Jesus, the the Marxist. In fact, it was A.W. Tozer who also lists the following false images. Idols. For you know there's a romantic Christ of the romance novelist. There's the sentimental Christ of the half-hearted uh, cowboy. There's the philosophical Christ of the academic egghead. And there's the cozy Christ of the poet. And there's the muscular Christ of the all-American halfback. We so often turn Jesus into who we think Jesus ought to be. We turn Jesus into who we think Jesus ought to be. I, I, I love, you know, I, I, I love that, well, well I, don't, I don't think Jesus would have done that. Well, how do you know? Have you talked to him about it? I heard this this past week. Oh, can't go that far. I heard this this past week. It was in the book of Revelation where the 23 elders, right? And we know about the 23 elders. They've been, they've been in heaven you know, for quite some time. I was reminded this past week about how every time the 23 elders turn and look at the face of God, they see a different side of His face. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Here's the thing I don't want to do, right? Here's the thing I don't want to do. I never want to take the wonder away from Jesus, right? Like, like God help us if we try to take the wonder and the greatness out of who God is, right? Because He's great. He's awesome, 
right? And when we do these things, when we idolize our feelings, when we idolize our desires, when we idolize who we think God ought to be and how he th- how we think he ought to do it according to our way, we miss the point. We miss the greatness of who God is. We miss the awesomeness of Jesus. The Israelites with their golden calf attempting to create a Jesus that meets our needs. The idol factory of our hearts is engaged around the clock with producing imaginary Jesus. Imaginary Jesus. John Owen, who was a great Puritan, once warned, If you're satisfied with an imaginary Jesus, you must be satisfied with an imaginary salvation. If you're satisfied with an imaginary Jesus, you're satisfied with an imaginary salvation. Jesus' third sign here, which, which it's, it's the fourth one that we're talking about, right? But the third sign of Jesus healing the nobleman's son not only reveals the glory of Jesus as the Son of God, but it also forces us to ask ourselves whether we've created an imaginary Jesus. And this sign also challenge our, challenges our tendency um, to desire a, a, a God who exists solely to serve our felt needs. A God to serve only our felt needs. In this third sign, Jesus calls us to reject all false images of Him. All false images of Him and embrace the true Jesus. Instead of asking him for a sign, Jesus calls us to seek him as our Savior. And so today we're going to look at a conversation that Jesus had with a government official that led to a miracle in his life. This man heard from God in a crisis, and since we too um, face crises in our lives, we need to hear from God. Amen. We need to hear from God. And as this story unfolds, it suggests several principles for hearing from God in a crisis. And if you're taking notes, you can write them down. All three of them begin with the letter F as in frog. You got that? Okay. So John chapter 4, starting in verse 43, we know the backstory, right? Jesus and the Samaritan woman, right? Didn't have to walk through Samaria, but he goes through Samaria. He has a conversation with this woman, completely Uh, uh, turns her life upside down and in turn has a great response from all of the people in Samaria. So encouraged by that, that's where we pick up, right? Jesus is encouraged by the response in Samaria because it, it, it shouldn't have been that way. It shouldn't have been that way. So we pick up in verse 43 where it reads, After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Isn't that interesting? A prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came, to, he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made water into wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, just come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed, underline that, star that, believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So, the first principle that I want to talk about today in this sign. Actually, let's back up for just a second. Because we talked about, right, how how John takes a little bit of a different uh, 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 course with his gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're much more um, detailed and kind of by the script. John focuses on on a different side of Jesus's ministry, particularly giving these 
seven signs. And the setting we've talked about is important for understanding each of the signs. And and what's important about this setting is that Jesus is back in his hometown. Jesus is back in his hometown. How many of you have sat around that family dinner table, right? Believe something so strongly that you actually spoke up at Thanksgiving dinner around the pecan pie, the pumpkin pie, right? You believe so strongly about something you spoke up, and then that family member rolled their eyes. Anybody? Okay, I see those hands. I see those hands, right? Right? A prophet is of no use in his hometown, right? Now, now, now we get this because they had grown up with Jesus, right? The family that we're sitting around the Thanksgiving table with or Christmas breakfast or, or whatever the tradition is in your house, right? And you're, you're talking with your family, right? They've grown up with you. They know the ins and outs of you, right? They know your flaws better than anybody. Right? They know your flaws better than anybody. It's almost like after, after every sermon, when I walk past Bria and Micah, my 12 and 10 year old, they give me the fact check list of the sermon. This story was embellished a little bit. This sto- You didn't tell this story right at all, daddy. That's not how that happened whatsoever. And I'm like, girls, not important. Right? Not important. Because they hear the story that they want to hear. Anyway, 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 beside the point, beside the point, right? But it's hard to get love and respect in your hometown. I'll be honest with you. Um, is, it all right if I, if, is it all right if I'm real this morning? I know it's outdoor service and everybody wants to feel good, but I read this this week and thought to myself, man, yes, I've seen that. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, I love going down to North Carolina and preaching one week or going up to Camp 207. Y'all that are, y'all that are Camp 207ers, we would have just ended Camp 207 on Thursday and you would have fallen asleep Thursday night and just woke up this morning to come to church. Oh, things we missed out on. But I love going and speaking at those places. You know why? Because they still think I'm awesome. Right? Man, it's it's a great feeling to get to get done and 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 have so many people come up to you. Like like driving home from North Carolina back to Maine after speaking for two weeks in North Carolina to families affected by disabilities. It's like Kristen has to just humble me all the way from Washington, DC back to Massachusetts. And then home. But it feels good, right? It feels good sometimes to be appreciated and to, and to talk to people that don't hear you all the time, right? Because sometimes y'all can get used to this voice. Sometimes this voice can just sound so repetitive and so, and so. oh yeah, here he goes again, getting excited. I'll tune out for the next five minutes and think about the Celtics game this afternoon at one o'clock. But Jesus noticed this. And so the setting and the fact that he's back in his hometown and owns the fact, right, that he had said a prophet is of no use in his own town, right, that's important as we look at the miracle that he did here. It's important as we look at the miracle he did here. The setting is extremely important. And so the first principle that I want us to look at and get in this is focus. Okay, so focus. Everybody say focus. Focus. Focus on looking for God. Focus on looking for God, not just looking for a miracle. See, we're used to the adage, right? We're used to the saying, seeing is believing, right? Seeing is believing, experiencing is believing, tasting is believing. But this story suggests a better teaching, that hearing is believing. This story submits to us that hearing is believing. We're often looking for a miracle when God just wants us to be listening to his word. After the official stated his problem, Jesus continues the conversation with a question in verse 48. Let's look back at it. Um, verse 47, when the man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked for him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. 
And then the official has to say again, the official said to him, sir, just come down before my child dies. Right? Just come heal him. I believe that you can heal him. Just come and heal him. And Jesus is saying, must I do miraculous signs and wonders before you so that people will believe in me? And this question is aimed at the man's expectations. Right? At first, the royal official thought Jesus had to travel back to Capernaum with him, a distance of approximately 20 miles over the Judean hill, hills. And as Stacy mentioned last week, that 20-mile journey would have taken a day, at least a day, at least a day. And so this man goes up to Jesus saying, listen, I want you to travel back with me and heal my son. Travel back with me and heal my son. He believed that if Jesus would physically touch his son, that he'd heal him. But Jesus wanted to know if the man would have to see a miracle in order to believe him, or if he would take Jesus at his word. Would he hear and believe, or did he have to see and believe? And I want us to not overlook the fact that Jesus' question was plural. Must I do miraculous signs and wonders before you people will believe in me? He was speaking to more than just the man. He was speaking to the people. He knew that more people were standing around there to listen to him. And here's the reality that we see in Jesus in this story. He was sad. He was sad because of the spiritual condition of his own people. The Jews. Specifically the citizens of Galilee where he grew up. He was sad because of the spiritual condition of his own people. Can anybody relate to that? Don't raise your hands necessarily with this one. Can anybody relate to that today? That as you as you look around at some things that are happening in the church across America, as you look at around at things that are happening, things that are being said, things that are being thrown out there, tossed out there, right? Some of our eyes are being opened, some of our eyes are being opened to the spiritual condition of our culture. Some of our eyes are being saddened. Some of our hearts are being broken over the church of Jesus and, 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 and thinking and thinking maybe, 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 maybe we're not quite as far along as we thought we were. We're not quite as far along as we thought we were. So here's, here's the crux of the message as we sit here this morning. We talk about focusing. Hear, hear me, church. Hear me, church. Hear my heart. Is God calling us back to a basic faith a basic faith see see some of us some of us need to go back to a basic faith some of us need to go back to the jesus that we heard about when we first believed some of us need to go back to basics a basic faith notice i didn't say we need to go back to a boring faith for some of us i think we think oh we're good we're good i've been in the church for 50 years i've served this way i've served this way i've served that way i've served this way i've served that way i've done all the things right and for me to go back to the fact that the, the core fact that jesus Jesus is just madly in love with me. Oh, that's boring. I'm, I've graduated from that. I've graduated from that. But can I tell you something this morning, church? Those are the truths that my those are the truths that my heart today continues to go back to, because I feel like for 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 a little bit here, right? We've we've tried to idolize and kind of make up our own faith that's not of God. It's just not, hear me, it's not godly and it's not biblical. And so some of us need to, need to sit and say, okay, I need to go back to a basic faith. And that's not boring. Let me tell you something. If we ever get sick or tired of hearing, Stanley, Jesus loves you and he's crazy about you and he wants your heart and he wants your time and he wants your devotion he wants your commitment if we ever get tired of hearing that god help us that's a good place to say something and wipe sweat 
Because see, Jesus, we know this, right? We know this, but let's back up for just a second. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. He grew up in Nazareth in Galilee. He returns to his home turf. He's keenly aware of the barrier that he must breach to get these people to believe in him, right? They watched him grow up. And during all those years, he hadn't performed any miracles. For 30 years, Jesus hadn't performed any miracles. We get a snapshot of his life when he was 13 years old in the temple, um, running away from his parents. See, parents, it's normal. Jesus did it. And the reason for not having performed any of these miracles from, you know, from birth to 30 is because his time hadn't yet come. He says that at the wedding. Jesus was the son of a carpenter to the Galileans, not the son of God. And when Jesus was growing up, he purposely operated under the radar. So the Galileans didn't understand who Jesus really was. And like many people today, they dismissed Jesus because they didn't really know him. They dismissed him because they didn't really know him. And so this story that we're looking at this morning is getting to know him is, 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 is about getting to know him, not just getting something from him. It's about hearing from him. And that's why Jesus pluralized the question. The failure to listen to God because we've already got our minds messed up, made up, messed up, made up, same thing. Is a universal problem. Back to Jesus' question, must I do miraculous signs and wonders before you people will believe in me? Must I fit into your mold? Must I conform to your expectations? Or, or maybe, just maybe, will you believe in me because I say something is true? Would you trust me because I say something is true? Will you believe my word? And this question doesn't simply imply that Jesus doesn't want us to approach him when we need his help. This question is intended as a positive reinforcement for believing without always requiring a sign for believing and for believing before our problems get solved, not just after. Believing before our problems get solved, not just after. John uses the signs in his good news account to provide a foundation for our faith, but our faith is not to be based on excessive interest in miracles. We need to balance our thinking. We need to balance our thinking. See, we miss a lot of great work that God wants to do in our lives because we're not paying close enough attention to His Word. See, Jesus didn't travel to Capernaum with this official to heal His Son. And the Father didn't have to witness the miracle to believe in Jesus. If Jesus said it was going to happen, it was going to happen. We don't have to see it to believe it. All we have to do is hear God say it to believe it. The big problem, then and now, when it comes to focusing, is that most people are confused about what faith is really about. The big problem between then and now, as we read this story, is that most people are confused about what faith is really about. See, their concept, our concept of faith, let's personalize it today, our concept of faith is usually one or two extremes. One of two extremes. You ready? The first extreme says, I will believe only what I can see. I will believe only what I can see. This leads to a danger of being a superficial believer. I'll believe only what I can see. This was a problem with the Galileans. They didn't know Jesus. They only knew about Jesus. And this is some of the condition of us today that we think we're a Christian because we know all about Jesus. We could preach the message. We could teach the Sunday school lesson because we know tons about Jesus. But listen to me, church, listen to me. We're not a believer until we know him personally. We're not a believer until we know him personally. See, Jesus wanted this man, Jesus wanted this man to have what he wants all of us to have. A relationship with him. A relationship with him. I know, I know, I know it sounds so Sunday school 20 years ago. But Jesus wants to be our friend. Listen, listen, Jesus wants to be our friend. That's not cheesy. That's awesome. <laughs> That's incredible truth right there. Jesus wants to be our friend. He wants to walk with us through everything. He wants to be there. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. And Jesus wanted this nobleman, this official, to get, to get that. To get that. He wants us to know him. He wants us to have a relationship with him based on the fact that we believe in him. So the other, the, the first extreme, right? The see to believe. The second extreme. I will believe everything I hear. You know somebody like that? I will believe everything I hear. Everything I hear. I will believe everything I hear. There's a lot of that going on in there. I mean, we were even confused this week. We were even confused this week. And I don't share this to, to, to make you nervous. I share this, hopefully, to give you more comfort. Because we, were, we, were, we, we saw articles halfway through the week, right? That the, that the outdoor gathering is still at 100. And we've been saying 200. And we're like, what in the world? And so we panicked for a minute and thought, well, do we have the $10,000 to pay the fine if something goes? I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, hey, hey, we panicked for a minute because we're seeing 100 and, and here, and we had seen 200 in, in some certain articles. So we had to dig and we had to dig and we're like, what do we believe? Where do we find this out? And so here's, here's the classification. And I share this with all with you to let you know what you are at today. Spectator events. You see a stage, microphone, speakers, spectate. We're all lined up facing a place, right? Spectator events can have the pods of 50, 14 feet apart in their own bathrooms and all the things like you're sitting in right now, safety measures. The registration team did a phenomenal job spacing you guys out and sending you to the right place. But if we're having a family reunion, like Pastor Ian said we were going to have last week, that's not what this is. You got me? But it's confusing. It's confusing. We were going to a meeting Thursday morning like, are we in compliance? Are we not in compliance? What in the world? And so we finally found it. Spectator events. And so as you go out and you share today and you tell all the people on your Facebook, hey, I was at a spectator event today. I was not at a family gathering or anything like that. Got me? Okay, very good. Very good. Glad we got that out there. But the other extreme is I'll believe everything I hear. Right? I'll believe everything I hear. And we certainly know people like that, but that's not true faith either. That's not true faith either. That's why John presented this seven miracles in his good news account and stated that Jesus did even more signs and miracles that weren't recorded in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. There's plenty of evidence to support faith in Jesus, overwhelming evidence and disputable evidence. Fulfilled prophecies, the harmony of scriptures, changed lives. Yes, the miracles of Jesus, to name a few. And listen to me, faith is not. Somebody say not. Faith is not kissing common sense goodbye. That's not faith. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what we're talking about today. It is coming to our senses. Yet you don't have to believe everything that you hear that is supposed to be spiritual truth. You can, however, believe every word of Christ. You can believe every word of Jesus. You can trust every word of the Bible because it's God's word. Verse 50 says the man believed Jesus believed Jesus' word, and started home. See, we need to follow this man's example. We need to live in the assurance that if God's word says it, we can believe it. That if God's word says it, we can believe it. And so when we face something in our lives, we need to look for what God wants to say to us, not just what we want Him to do for us. And so focus on God's word and not our feelings. Focus on God's word and not what everybody else is saying. Focus on God's word. The second F for us today is follow. Follow. 
Focus on God's word. Follow God's word. This man heard the word and then heeded the word, did what the word said. Jesus' response to the man's need was to say, I'm not going to give you a sign, but I'll give you something else. I'll give you a word. Go, your son is healed. I won't give you property, but I'll give you the deed to the property. See, listen to me, church. We haven't received all of our inheritance yet. But we have read the will. We don't need to look for miracles as much as we need to follow what we hear God say. If you're following God's instructions and you have confidence in life, if you have encouragement in discouraging times, you have victory even when the circumstances around you spell defeat. See, we think we need the miracle in order to survive. But Jesus taught us by his own example that that's not so. After Jesus had gone without food for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, Satan said to him, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Satan was challenging Jesus to perform a miracle. Jesus refused to fall for it. It's recorded in Matthew 44 that Jesus told him, no, for the scriptures tell us that bread won't feed men's souls. Obedience to every word of God is what we need. How about one more? Remember the time Simon Peter was fishing with his fellow fishermen? They spent all night. They didn't catch a thing. And then Jesus comes to the shore. I mean, put yourself in Peter's shoes for a minute. We give Peter a bad rap for a couple different things, but put yourself in Peter's shoes for a minute. You've been out all night on the boat fishing. He had not caught a thing. That's what happens when I go fishing. Don't catch a thing. We went fishing back in June all week while we were at Sebago Lake State Park camping. Guess what we caught? Nothing. I I was out there praying, Stanley. I was out there praying, Pastor Rick. I was out there praying, God, this is Ezra's first time fishing. If you could just give, well, it was his second time. Second time fishing. If you could just give us one fish to let him know how awesome his daddy is. Heavenly daddy, right? I mean, let's just, right? That'd be awesome. We didn't catch a thing. Didn't catch a thing. But Simon Peter's out there been, been fishing all night. Didn't catch anything. Jesus comes along and says, hey, cast your nets on the other side. Right? And they caught more fish than they could bring in. More fish than they could breathe in. Peter says, Luke 5, 5, Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. The Bible says they caught so many fish, their net almost broke. See, God's help for us in any season of life is His word. His word. Everything in the Bible, the principles, the promises, the proofs, the teaching, the praise, the prayers, the preaching, the promptings, the prophecies, the, uh, even the prohibitions are beneficial for us. So focus, follow, and then the last one's this. Find. 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 Where do you think we're going to focus with this one? Look at verse 53. The Father knew... Right? So, so son's healed. Right? These folks from town come run out to meet him on the road as he's journeying back in. So your son's healed. And he says, at what hour was he healed? And they say the seventh hour. Knowing that that was, that was the moment when Jesus said what he said. Right? In verse 53, the father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and and all his household, and all his household. See, the point is this, find someone and share the good news, right? Focus on the word of God, follow the word of God, and then find someone and share the good news. Find someone and share the good news. And the question I have for us today is what Jesus, what is the Jesus that we're communicating to the people around us? What character of Jesus are we communicating to the people around us? I know we're, I know it's getting hot, y'all. I know we're getting restless. Give me about 30 more minutes, okay? That's it. That's it. I only got one chance to preach today, so. The scripture says, and he himself believed and all his household. And all his household. I don't know about you, but that's inspirational. I 
What's the Jesus look like that you're communicating back to the people that you love, to the people that you work with? to the people that you do life with. This man went home and shared Jesus with all of his family, all of his friends, and they too believed in Jesus. See, Jesus could have gone to this man's home in Capernaum, healed his son in person, but this story fits right into the plan of God. Jesus commissioned those who have heard and believed the good news to share it with others. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, everywhere, Mark 16, 15. But Jesus performed signs so that people would believe in him as Messiah, not as miracle worker. He wanted to believe them. He wanted them to believe without props. But they only sought him for a sign. So two things in closing. Two things in closing. The world seeks a sign. I believe right now, church, listen to me. The world seeks a sign. If you haven't joined us in the 40 days of prayer, I encourage you to join us in the 40 days of prayer. It's being posted on Facebook. You can ask anybody about it on, on staff. We'll, we'll, we'll get you hooked into the, to the 40 days of prayer. I believe if, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. Forgive their sin and heal their land. We need to pray. We need to pray for God to heal our land. And listen, listen, listen. Can we just say something real quick? I'm, I'm, that's bigger than COVID. That's bigger than COVID. That's bigger than masks. That's bigger than a political party and an election and all that stuff. We need God to heal our land, somebody. Okay? Okay, and so I'm not up here with an agenda saying we need to pray that God would heal our land because we're all at odds with masks and all these. No, I don't. Look, that I don't care. Okay? It's deeper than that. Look around. We need God to heal our land. The world's looking for a sign. Like the nobleman, our world demands a sign before it's willing to believe in God. See, people want God to do something for them before they'll believe in Him. Our world is enamored with pragmatism. Or what works for them. We live in an age, and I'm not knocking it, but let's just call it what it is, right? Let's just call it what it is. Not knocking it, not criticizing it, okay? I do some of it. But our age depends on therapy, self-help, prescriptions, all these things. And so when people explore religion or Christianity, they look for something that's going to solve their problems. They look for a God that's going to solve their marriage. They look for a God that's going to solve their, 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 their food problem or, or their financial problem or, or, or their depression problem or their anxiety problem, right? And so when the world looks for God, when the world looks for a God, they look for a God that's going to fix their problems. They ask, what can this do for me? Will it help me? The world seeks a sign. Are we ready to tell them about Jesus? Secondly, the church seeks a sign. You seek a sign. I seek a sign. Praying to God on Sebago Lake. God, if you would just give us one little fish. I mean, you know I'm going to go in front of the church and tell everybody that Ezra and I caught a fish and it was this big. Even though it was like that. But I didn't even get that. Jesus' rebuke was not primarily directed at the world. Rather, it was focused on his fellow Jews. It was targeted at the church of the first century world. He was saying, accept the signs and wonders and believe. Jesus was rebuking them for seeking a sign rather than seeking him. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, does that rebuke apply to us today? Are we seeking a sign? Or are we seeking Jesus? Who are you seeking? What are you seeking today? My challenge, my encouragement is to seek the God of the signs. Not the sign. Seek the God of the sign. Change our focus. 
shift what we're following. Find somebody to share it with. By healing this man's son with his mere word, Jesus made it absolutely clear of two things. Number one, he was the son of God. Number two, he was the giver of life. Jesus made it absolutely clear that he was the son of God. By just healing, I mean, not touching this boy, made it absolutely abundantly clear that he was the son of God and that he was the giver of life, is the giver of life. Listen to me, last thing I want to say, last thing, I want, no, it's not the last thing I want to say, but we're, Dylan, Bree, uh, Tammy, you guys come on and make your way up here. See, we don't always get the miracle, but we still need the faith in the God of miracles. I was reading this morning in Acts chapter 9, and as I was reading it, I was like, okay, God, I just feel like you want us to close out with this today. Acts chapter 9, give you a little bit of background. Paul just got converted. Paul, who, who um, used to uh, persecute the church, had just been converted to Christianity. And later on in chapter 9, Oh, i got to find it again. There it is. There it is. Later on in chapter 9, it says, it's, it's Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, talking about Paul, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. Why? Because he had persecuted the church his entire life. Like, it makes total sense why the church would be afraid of him, right? They were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him into the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, how he had met Jesus who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. That's a bad day. Right? How many of you say that's a bad day? Saul just being converted. He's out there preaching against the Hellenists, rebuking them, and they're seeking to kill him. That's what the scripture says. That's a bad day. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Did you hear that? Walking in the fear of the Lord, worship, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, relationship. The church multiplied. God built them up. God built them up. So before we complain, right, about our situation, about our, about our, 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 our circumstance, they were trying to kill him. But they went on in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. What's your focus? Who are you following? And would you find somebody to tell them about the hope that you have in Jesus? See, I'm convinced of this. And again, this is why I wanted to go through this series. I told you I'm convinced we need to pray more. We need to hit our knees more. But I'm also convinced we need to talk about Jesus more. We need to talk about Jesus more. Not asking each other whether or not he wear a mask. Because we don't know. I don't know. But talking about how awesome he is and how crazy he is about us and how much he wants to save us. And give us life. And give it abundantly. There it is. All right, Jeff, I heard the message. So I challenge you to talk about Jesus more. God, make that our heartbeat. That we would focus on you and your word and what you tell us. That we follow you and your word for us. And that we find somebody to share it with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.